Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Hot Issues. This week, Transparency International released a 2019 uh, Corruption Perception Index, which uh, place indicated that Ghana uh, didn't really make any uh, progress uh, from the 2018 figure. It has been at the same position, although globally uh, it declined by some two points. I'm here with uh, the local chapter, uh, Ghana Integrity Initiative, to speak with the Ghana Integrity Initiative about uh, the Corruption Perception Index and other corruption-related issues here in Ghana. Uh, and I have with me Linda Oforikwa, for Executive Director of Ghana Integrity mm -hmm. Initiative. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good Thanks afternoon. Thanks very much uh, for being on a hot issue. So mm -hmm. uh, let's look at Ghana's performance on, on the 2019 uh, Corruption Perception Index. What are your commentary on it? Why are we where we are since 2008 and having made significant progress on the local front? I think um, the Corruption Perception Index, as we all know, is an index that looks at the extent to which business people and experts perceive public sector corruption in, of a country. So then we have people who are watching Ghana and they do business in Ghana and they are saying that we are not, that is where, when I look at Ghana as a country, the score we gave you in 2018 is the same, we see you. And so then it's actually, we say it's a composite index. It's a number of indices that has been put together, standardized, and then an average taken. And an average is what we use for the score. And then the ranking is because you have about a number of countries participating. So for you to qualify actually to be on the CPI, you should have at least three or more of the indices used. This year we have 13 different services used. Ghana had nine of them covering the country. Mm. And any other country that joined should have about three or more indices being used. And so um, we don't actually go into issues like money laundering and all those things. The services, the services that are used are focusing on corruption, mm. political corruption, mm. and public sector corruption. So is it an indication that we're doing bad or we're not improving? I mean, what uh, it means some of us is, want to put a context to the whole meaning of this. Uh, okay, so then on a scale of 0 to 100, if Ghana scored 41 Which last did. year, mm. And Ghana scored 41 again this year, then Ghana can be said to have maintained a score. And so if I perceived you to be this level or this much corrupt last year, I'm perceiving you to be saying this year, meaning we can do better. And it's very important and instructive to state that Transparency International, the originators of the survey, are saying that all countries performing below on a, a 50 are not doing well. So meaning Ghana is within the country that are performing below 50. And so since 2012, when the CPI became comparable year in, year out, because the methodology was changed, Ghana has been dancing around the 40, 45, 46, 40, whatever. Our highest score ever was in 2014, 48. And then we dropped until last year, we were able to gain one point up. And this year we have maintained So that point. is it fair to use these indices every year as a measure of the government's commitment to fight corruption? It is the most important survey or indices or index that we have worldwide i'm telling you so then business people and those who want to do business in ghana or in any other country will look out for the corruption perception index of a country before they take a step so if you want to have a ghana beyond aid we want to actually attract more people to do business here we should be seen to be progressing very well on our cpi score mm. we have countries like rwanda seychelles botswana all scoring above 50 and they're actually in the region of the 60s, so about 55 upwards. And then we have Ghana performing better than 37 other countries who are scoring below 41. What it means is that if we think that Ghana is doing well, then Ghana, we are competing with people who are actually not doing well. Countries that are not doing well, so we can actually, in the land of the blind man, the one-eyed man is what is king. And that's what we are thinking that as a country, we have done so well. But then we can actually do better only if we are able to cross 50, and that is what... TI is saying. And so what can we do to get better? A lot of things. You see, um, I said it's a composite index. So a number of indices were used. Some of the indices we actually performed well, others we dropped. One area where we scored about, where we dropped by seven points. The, in the previous year, in that particular in, uh, in this uh, survey, we have actually scored 37. 
this year 2019 we actually that's 2019 cpi we scored 30 we dropped by seven points and that particular survey they are looking at matters in relation to award of contracts and if you are in this country you realize that in 2019 if there is any area we suffered it has to do with award of contracts there was a big issue around that and the business people all over the world were picking that as an indicator why i should give ghana a lower score because they are not performing well and then there are others that we gain about five points others we also gain about three points but then because we dropped so much on a particular index it actually affected our performance on the cpi as a whole so in some areas we might be doing well or the business people do not perceive that there is so much corruption in a certain areas but then in areas like procurements and contracts awards and all those things obviously we did not do well so far as the indices that were used in computing the cpi index are concerned so the critics of uh, the uh, the current administration have said that that's why coming to power on the back of uh, you know uh, fighting corruption and all of that it hasn't done too well and in fact done poorly when it comes to dealing with graft issues and corrupt issues within its administration compared to, for example, the NDC administration worst uh, performance uh, in, in, in 2012 appears to be the best performance of the current administration when it comes to uh, indices of this kind. Uh, you think the current administration is just paying lip service to uh, the fight against corruption? Okay, so then TI will always say that if you introduce new initiatives mm -hmm. like you hear the vice president talking about all the time i think even during the Ahmadiyya muslim mm -hmm. co big conference in winneba and um, we heard him saying that they've done a b c d paperless sports and all those things he mentioned those initiatives do not just jump or translate mm -hmm. into good figures on the cpi score i must say that transparency international is saying that ghana is a country to watch so then it says that Ghana has passed um, a Rights Information Act, which was passed just last yeah. year. Yeah. Ghana has passed the Witness Protection Act. Ghana now has a new Companies Act that is going to deal with issues of beneficial ownership and all those things. You realize that those acts that were passed just last year in 2019, though they are good, they just do not translate into a better CPI score. Because RTI is not being implemented. It's mm -hmm. yet to be mm -hmm. implemented. Mm -hmm. So some initiatives have been done by this administration that they will talk about. But then these ones are not automatic jump from a bad grade uh, as the other people want us to believe. But I always stand by the point that if TI says that countries performing below 50 are not doing well, it means that Ghana as a country have never done well on the CPI score. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether it was party A or party, or party B. B. What it or means is that a or government yes, B. Gov Ghana would be able to do well if all stakeholders, being led by the government in part at a particular point, are committed to doing A, B, C, D. So we need laws to fight corruption. We just don't need beautiful laws on paper. We need to fill in the gaps in the laws, and then we need to implement the laws that we have. We need to sanction where we have to sanction. If you say I've given this institution about uh, this millions amount of money, has the money been used? Are we able to say that we've been, all these resources that have been put together or given to the institution since last year, we've been able to make some dramatic change in the things that we were doing in the life. If we don't do those things, we are not likely to make any... Since you raised the issue of the right to information uh, law, I would like to touch on that a little bit, and then we'll come back to uh, the anti-corruption institutions of state and assess their performance. But uh, we sent our reporters, the RTI is supposed to have come into effect this month, we sent our reporters uh, to some ministries, and they were denied access. They were not granted access. Is this troubling? It's quite unfortunate. You see, when government makes a commitment and says that implementation will start in 2020, then people are, we are expecting that 2020 January, things will start. I don't hold brief for government and I don't, it's not my business to do so. But then, obviously, we have high expectations because we are dealing with the subject matter of corruption. So then we are just hoping that by now, we should see some institutions ready and capable of providing information, mm -hmm. but you ask ourselves, how many institutions in this country have even the database to be able to have the, all the, uh, the, the information stored so well mm -hmm. that they can easily pull it out for you? But because government made a commitment that 2020 implementation will start, I'm sure if you want to take any legal action, when they are, you are being denied information, 
You should be able to get but some are you results. are you confident that uh, the right information law, uh, the guidelines that have come out for its implementation, are you confident that we're going to go far with this implementation I, I, within I am, the short period? I am very much convinced that that is the role of civil society and the media. We don't have to let the duty bearers rest. You have to hold them for them to be accountable to the commitment that they have made. Because you have a social contract with them. We, all of us, cannot be keeping information of the state. So one institution or one government or one organization has that power and the mandate to do so. And you are keeping it in trust for us. So then if you commit to ensure that in 2020 we will start implementation, if you have challenges in when it should kick starts, let us know. Because I have a right to assess at the information at the time that you promised I can have it. And actually, we also we actually talked about proactive disclosures under the right information. So then there are some institutions that might not have everything set or government might not be ready to, to roll out the implementation. But some institutions already have, there are good ones who have in, uh, information that they can actually start giving out. And under the proactive disclosures, they are supposed to do so. And when they do so, in an era where we are awarding institutions for good performance, like we did last year with the Integrity Awards, we can actually name them and actually mention them, commend them for the good work that they are doing. Mm. So I believe that I am confident that we will continue to hold government accountable until they roll out the RTI. I know the planning, we have been part of the meetings being organized by the Information Ministry and all that. The coalition has actually been consistent in participating in these meetings. So we are hopeful that we are not going to rest on our house. We are going to ensure that the government rolls out the RTI as promised. And that mm. is the work of CSUs. I know that this government, uh, I, I, I said earlier that when the government came into power, it came into power on the back of the fight against corruption. And President Kufuado himself had indicated clearly that the setting up of the office of the special prosecutor was one of his key tools, I should say, trump card in uh, fighting corruption. Do you get a sense that since the establishment of the office of the special prosecutor, uh, it has uh, fit that bill, it has mm -hmm. actually uh, indicated or showed to us the commitment to fighting corruption? I think from where I sit, I would say much progress has been made. And I say, I say so because, not because I'm part of the, or I contribute, I do. And that's part of the fact that uh, out of 180 million or so allocated to the office in funds uh, by the government, only 80, per, okay, 80, so 80 million was provided. It's always very important. Indicating perhaps that the government is not willing to fund the, the running of the office of the special prosecutor. Is that I think what, it's always very it important is? for us to discuss issues in context. Mm -hmm. We had high expectations because we really wanted to fight corruption. So the nation was like, we want um, the ONCA recommendations have recommended that we need an OSP office. All the two major political parties have contested on the back of setting up an office of this nature. The technologies or use or might be different. But whatever it is, we all knew that we needed an office that was specialized only on corruption cases. And so we set up an office. We should also bear in mind that we are dealing with a crime. And dealing with a crime is not as easy as, if I can put it lightly, selling tables by the roadside. You need to put or in oranges place... Oranges and oranges bananas. And bananas. Mm -hmm. You need to put in place the right infrastructure to be able to deal with this issue. And you think this government is committed to that? Okay, so then the office says that... I don't speak for the office. Mm -hmm. The office says that we need accommodation. Where we are currently is not big enough because we are supposed to recruit a number of people to work with or work for us. Currently, because we don't have a big space, we are not able to do so. Then government says that I'm making efforts to ensure that you have a big space. Ah, uh, is this effort being made? These are the things we're supposed to be interrogating. And if so, then we can say that some efforts are being made. Secondly, you talk about not being able to spend the money that was allocated to the office or the government not providing that money. Yeah. For you to be able to do so, you need a, what, an, a tender committee. As at last year, I think before we went on Christmas break, that was when the committee came into being. So then how was the office going to use public resources after consultation has been made with the Auditor General? And we know for sure that even though the Auditor General itself knows the system, if you act and act wrongly, you'll be held, because of the new um, ruling by the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. disallowance and surcharges. If you don't take care, some of these things will come up, will catch up with you. Mm -hmm. So then we need to have the right systems in place. Mm -hmm. So without that committees and all those things, some expenditures couldn't have happened. 
Why do you go for money when you're not able to spend? Because you don't have the committees, and even it will not be released to you. So I'm not saying that uh, we couldn't have done much more than the office did last year. We have to actually discuss the subject matter in context. And so you think said, the failure of the Office of the Special Prosecutor to make that anticipated impact is as a result of uh, failure of uh, government or failure of leadership? Those are your words. You are a journalist. You can say it the way you say them. Mm. From where I said, I would say that How some, say progress, that? some progress have been made because we are dealing with a crime. We need to pass the law. We had a law. You need to set up the office. You have the office. You need to have... Um, the regulations in place. We work towards having the regulations in place. And now we need to have the committees that will be able to spend money. Now advertisements were done and I know recruitment will happen. You have to take all these things in consideration before you actually pass a judgment, whether the office has spilled or not. But Ghanaians, including me, myself, and every other Ghanaian, yeah. actually have so much expectation. We just want to nip corruption at the back. So then we, anything that we have to do, even you have to actually go around um, picking up corrupt people from their homes, like we used to do so many years back. Mm. People want to see those things happening. But for me, from where I sit, I think that if given much more room, the office will be able to deliver the way you are, Ghanaians are expecting the office So you to think deliver. we're better off with the office of the special the establishment than without it? Yes, because the, the, even the fact that the public and experts outside the country are viewing the country, that Ghana now has an office of special persecution that alone can actually help in reducing the perception of a sort of corruption of the country. Right, uh, this is Hot Issues. We're discussing everything corruption, and on, in the hot seat is uh, Linda Oforikwa for the Executive Director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, the local chapter of Transparency International. We'll be right back. Please stay. Welcome back to Hot Issues. I still have with me Linda Forikwa for the Executive Director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, the local chapter of Transparency International. Um, this is an election year, madam, and uh, there are all sorts of promises back and forth. Uh, the, the government's performance on corruption is there to be assessed. Going into the election, what is there to celebrate about this current administration's commitment to corruption? the fight against corruption? I think when it comes to uh, the efforts made by governments, they are well presented better by governments. Mm -hmm. I, from where I sit, I will always mention the critical ing ingredients we need in an anti-corruption effort. So I'll talk about the laws that you need, mm -hmm. the institutions that you have in place. Effective procurement systems. Yes, you need all those things. Oversight, responsibility. Yes, and then also, even the information we get from the monitoring and evaluation mm -hmm. division of the government itself and how well they've been able to do on all fronts, including um, their efforts to fight corruption. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are best presented by the government. Right. I don't know but which of the as far as you, are, you are, are concerned, to, uh, the existence of relevant uh, institutions that are there to ensure the effective utilization of the public purse, ensure effective procurement and show commitment to the fight against corruption is enough. But how can we move from just the existence of these structures to ensure that they work effectively for, for, for us and as a nation? I never said they are enough. I said they are critical mm. if you're supposed to mm. be able to deal with the mm. subject matter of corruption. And so then if you have all the laws that you don't implement, the fourth mm. use mm. are those. And uh, recently we actually also got another uh, reports from the Auditor General, for instance, mm. and some of the issues that keep on coming every year, mm. we're still reflecting that particular mm. report. Meaning, mm. as a country, it doesn't matter whether it's a political leadership, institutional leadership, we mm. are not doing well. And so for us to be able to see any progress, citizens, we have a rule given to them by the NACAP, says report corruption. Mm. So GI, we have what we call the, the Advocacy and Legal Advice Center. You can walk in, call to free lines and report corruption. Then we have state institutions with a mandate to implement particular legislation, and they have to do so. And I always say that if you are going into an election, and then there is a law that says that if a public servant, you cannot actually leave your post, go and contest, and when you lose, you come back. No, you are supposed to resign at a point before you can able to participate in an election. TICPI 2019 is focusing on political integrity. Issues of vote buying are critical. Abuse of incumbency are critical. So if we are supposed to be seen, 
then the government should be taking making um, taking steps in order not to abuse incumbency mm -hmm. themselves because opposition cannot abuse incumbency only governments can abuse incumbency opposition should not be seen to be buying votes and government itself should not be buying votes vote selling and vote buying all go against we being seen as a country that actually entered an election creating a level playing field for everybody so for me going into the election these things are critical otherwise we implement the laws, we do everything, but the next year's CPI score is likely to dip mm. because the world stage will still be observing. Mm. If you realize, I make reference to the fact that contracting was the survey that documented contracting issues and procurement issues is where we dropped. Yeah. If you are very observant, then you re realize that the 2019 issues about procurement and all those things might have informed the people that responded to this particular service, that from where we are sitting, if you go to Ghana, public procurement has an issue. Awards of contract has an issue. We hear it in the news. We ourselves might have actually experienced it. So based on that, we are not scoring Ghana so high. Mm. That is how can we drop on that particular survey. So the world is watching us and everything that we do. So it's likely that going into an election with all the corruption issues that are always related or come up during an election year, if they are not checked, I can assure you, 2020 CPI will be worse than we currently have. Mm. You made mention of the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan. I want to touch on that briefly. How do you assess uh, our implementation as a country of this action plan? I think so far, so good. It's actually being led, implementation is being led by the Shraj. Mm. The beauty is that all stakeholders have rules. So then you are assigned a rule and then you are expected, if you're a public institution, that this year, this is my rule under the NACAP. I'm supposed mm. to do A, B, C, D. Then I'm, I'm supposed to budget mm. for the activity I'm supposed to do in the NACAP. And in the middle of the year and end of the year, I give my report back to Shraj. So there has a broad stakeholder mm. implementation strategy that has been put in place. Mm. And if citizens uh, citizens are going to report corruption, for instance, that is their role. And I must say, 2019, we saw an increase in the number of people who were reporting corruption, even to our ALAC, let alone to the Shraj and the other mm. institutions. If the media is going to play their role, so that we are going to be stay a bit more consistent with a particular issue until we see the end results. Like CSOs, we don't just touch on a separate matter and move on. The donors are saying that CSO should be more committed in following a particular issue to the end. So how many corruption allegations came up in 2019 and why are we with them? Mm. If we are not able to follow on these matters, government obviously will not follow them up on them for us. Mm. We need to hold them to account. I cannot take anybody to jail. I cannot investigate any matter. Journalists can do to a certain level, but then the government has the ultimate responsibility yeah. to ensure that investigations are properly done and sanctions happen. Do you think we're falling, we're falling short anyway with the implementation of the any day, uh, any time anti-corruption action plan? Oh, I think with the resources provided, Shraj, and the fact that state institutions are also playing a role, I cannot say that we are doing above seventy percent. Mm -hmm. We can do more. I don't have the figures on top of my head, but then we can do more. Mm. And then if you're able to do more, we are actually, I think we have crossed five years already of the NACAP, or we actually are in the fifth yeah. year of the NACAP. And we have a 10-year plan, so we should be careful how we move. Otherwise, I'm sure by the time the 10 years is up, we will still see we have a beautiful plan on paper. And then... So I get the, I get the impression from what you're saying that you think we're not moving fast enough. I think we are moving, but we can do better. We can do better. So critics of uh, the MPP administration, for example, have raised questions about the transparency of this administration, for example, where wrongdoings are leveled against government appointees, uh, uh, reports are, are created, investigation committees are set up, reports are created, which uh, never get published. What's your commentary on some of these uh, reports and investigative reports which never become public and we never know what led to them being cleared for example. Okay, so then we know that Ghana, we believe in the rule of law. And once something is documented in the law, we take full advantage of it. If you look at the commission's reports and all that, what does the constitution say about them? Are they all supposed to be published? Some of them are published because the government wants to publish them. But then if a government says that I am committed to fighting corruption, and you know the importance of transparency, accountability, the extent that you have actually passed a sunshine law like the RTI, then you should be seen to be proactively be disclosing information. 
That is the only way that people will build trust and confidence in you. We have an RTI law. Implementation has started. But then if I have the opportunity to hear government telling me what's happened in this particular investigation, then I, I'm like, I trust my government because they are giving me the full information that I'm looking mm. out for. And with information, it is power. People can do a lot. With information, can you imagine what the media can do if they have all the information to all the commissions of inquiries that have been set up? We can do so much with information. So you think government breaks no laws and uh, not publish It depends reports. on which particular information we are looking out for. But obviously there are some laws, even without laws, because we are in an era of open government, open transparency, accountability, RTI, whatever, government should be seen to be giving out so much information to the public because we have a contract of a sort with you. Mm. And some of them, um, we should not be hiding behind the law. Uh, I wouldn't want to use the term my husband usually use, that the law is, but then we should not be seen to be hiding behind the law. What has your husband been referring to? The I law wouldn't has? say so. Okay. I would have said so if right, I Right, you would have said so. So, so let's look at the, the performance on the indices so far because we've spoken about quite a number of issues. Uh, Ghana's performance from 2018, 2019 indices shows that we haven't uh, made a lot of changes on the global front. It, it showed that we had dipped. But overall, what do you think as a country we should be looking at improving so that we get better scores? Obviously, better scores will translate into effective management of anti-corruption issues within the country. Okay, so then before I actually try to respond to that question, I want to say that you said a global um, front, we have dipped because you are referring to the rank of the CPI. I want to say that the CPI will look more at the score and not the rank. Mm. This is because when the number of countries, including the CPI changes, mm. your rank is obviously going to change. Okay. So let's just look at the score. On the score, we stay at where we are. And over um, since 2012, we have been stagnating. And also, according to uh, TI, we are below 50, so we are not doing well. So these are the facts so where the CPI uh, is concerned. But then what we can do more? A lot of things. Mm. And if you look at the, the release that we brought out, you realize we're focusing so much on political integrity. And so we talked about issues dealing with matters in relation to nepotism, clientelism, and the people that are seen to be financiers of political party, and also money in elections and all those things. They're very critical because we are dealing with the subject matter of political integrity. Because every year, realize how much resources we push into elections, the big advertisements, and all those things that we don't even know where the parties are able to mobilize the resources for. And then we have a deficient um, political parties act that we are not able to really tell where the parties are getting their money from. And they're not being more or less accountable to anybody after they have actually spent the money. So then we finish an election. And then the, the next thing is that they have to be awarded all sorts of contracts to be able to recoup those money. Because they have to pay back the paymaster. And so we should be looking at these things and improving on them. It's only when we're able to do so that we can say that we're making progress, apart from the obvious thing of implementing the laws. These are other matters we're supposed to be looking at going into the election, how we are able to ensure that vote buying, abuse of incumbency, nepotism, clientelism, all those matters are brought to the barest minimum for us to know that Ghana is really committed in making some changes going into this. Particular I know you've been following uh, the work of uh, someone like the Auditor General, uh, Mr. Domilevo, in issuing surcharges, etc. There are those who uh, he himself had made the allegations before that there were elements who were making his work difficult. Do you get the sense that he's getting the needed cooperation to function effectively in the office he is? I get a sense that he's one of the best leaders we have had, institutional leaders we have had in this country for some time now. That is why the Ghana Integrity Initiative gave him an award last year. The second sense I also get is that it's not been easy for him. Mm. He's had challenges and from all sort of whatever. But then truth be told, I believe that some of these challenges are matters that can be dealt with. So now they are in court on certain matters. And we are a rule of law country. So then if you are alleged to have done A, B, C, D, and the matter comes and goes to law, you should also subject yourself for these investigations to be conducted. But truth be told, today, yesterday, last three years, since 2012, whatever it is, when it comes to one of the best institutional leaders committed to fighting corruption, 
I will give it to Daniel Demolovo any day, any time. And, and I we know, should be supporting him. I, I, I know also that most of the reports that the Auditor General uh, have brought up dating many years back, Public Accounts Committee sits over them and uh, very little is done about these reports in terms of uh, uh, punishing people, holding people accountable for specific things. And recently, two officers uh, from a uh, local assembly were ordered to be arrested by the uh, Public Accounts Committee because they presented uh, what appears to be falsified documentation before the committee. Do you think this is showing that, for example, the Public Accounts Committee and the Auditor General's Department are beginning to bite and bite more effectively? I think they've been biting, but it's just that they have not been biting so hard. They should be. We follow the implementation of the a committee's reports and even other general implementation the recommendations that he makes we've been following them under some projects and we think some institutions are really doing well at the district level so we we can do more as a country but then obviously that's an area we should check i am more interested in we being able to prevent corruption from happening than doing after the, the what the other general does is after the facts after the act has been committed he goes in there to check but then what can we do to prevent the stealing and the embezzlement from happening at all levels, including the district assembly levels that we talk about. But tell me what you want to see change between now and the end of the year when we go to elections. We always do a project titled Monitoring Abuse of Incumbency and Vote Buying, so political corruption. What I want to see change is that the political parties will act with integrity going into the election and not buy votes, citizens not selling votes. And then I also want to see, because obviously it will come up, corruption is going to be one of the big issues in those elections because we'll be comparing, the parties will be comparing their records. And from where we sit, we'll be watching them do so. But the truth is that scoring below 50 on the CPI tells us that Ghana, since 2012, has not been able to go above 50, so we are not doing well. I don't know what they will be comparing. Would they be comparing their inability to do well, or what would they be comparing? I think we, the citizens, we should be up and doing to hold them to account and vote for the best leaders. Leaders with integrity. And vote for the best leaders. Thank you very much uh, for being with us on Hot Issues. I'm Stephen Enti, and Linda Forikwafo has been in the hot seat. Thanks for making time. Good afternoon.